Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about Family Tree Maker 2012 and we're going to be spending some time looking at the filter options. Now this kind of goes along with the theme we started uh, on Tuesday, which was about focusing our research. Many of you know that I am a huge fan of the concept of having one tree. Um, I know a lot of you feel the need to have a tree for different parts of your family. Maybe you split it out by your parents or by, you know, you have four trees, one for each of your grandparents. Um, and I understand that there are reasons for doing that. However, um, one of the reasons that I hear from people a lot about why they do that is that they feel like their tree is too big or that it's too difficult to work with. And that's something that I have a hard time understanding because... I use filters so heavily because it allows me to just focus on the group of people that I want to work with and kind of ignore everybody else in my tree. Uh, and so filters, if, if the only reason that you only have that you have multiple trees is because you feel like it's too big, um, maybe this will help you see this vision of why um, you can use filters or how you can use filters to focus your research. Because the pros for having a single tree, there are, there are a lot of them. Um, one of them is that a lot, a lot of times we end up with intermarriage in our trees. And if you're working in one tree and you're adding people and then maybe you switch to working in another tree and you're adding people, you could end up with duplicates, not in a single tree, but in your in your two trees <laughs> um, and you'll end up doubling research which could have been discovered or caught um, with some of our duplicate notices if you had been doing it all in one tree. The other reason that I'm a huge fan of one of one tree per person is because it gives you a single view of your whole ancestry. Um, if you know if you're if you've broken out your tree by all four of your grandparents you'll never be able to have a single view of your entire pedigree um, that you've researched uh, without you know, merging all of those together. And, and that's possible. So if you've started multiple trees because you hadn't considered it or somebody told you that was the way to go, it is possible in Family Tree Maker to merge those trees together and create a single tree. And I would encourage you to look into that. But that's not what we're talking about today. Today we're talking about filters um, and how to use them to focus your research. So let's dive into that and let's talk specifically at first about why, um, some of the reasons why you might want to use filters. Uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of power here and I've put together some examples that I hope will just start to broaden your understanding of what's possible. But one of the reasons why I use filters is so I can do location based research. We get people all the time who ask us, you know, I want to be able to create a list or, or pull up all the people in my tree who, died in a certain location or who may have lived in a specific place or you know whatever and this in family tree maker you can do that uh, you can do that using pl the place tab but you can also do that using the filters and i'll show you how to do that i can also do event based research so for example if i want to pull up um, everybody in my tree um, all males in my tree who may have served in the Revolutionary War because they were of the right age, living in the right place at the right time, I can do that. If I want to pull up a list of um, you know, anybody who may have been involved in the World War I draft or any, any significant event in history, I can filter or focus down to a specific group of people who meet the criteria that makes them eligible to have participated in that event, whether it's a military event or any other kind of historical event. I can look for anybody in my family who may have been living in Kentucky or Tennessee when the 1812 earthquake hit so that I can see who may have been affected by that and look for trends in the way that they may have migrated out of that area following that earthquake. A lot of my family did. Another um, thing that I'm a huge fan of is descendancy research. I actually teach here at the local university and I was talking to one of my students after class last night and, and he said, you know what? He said, I really got excited about doing some genealogy and he said, I realized like I have grandparents and aunts and uncles who've been doing this for a long time and I don't think there's anything for me to do. 
And so I advised him to just pick an ancestor, um, maybe one that was born about 200 years or 250 years ago, and get to know everything he could about that ancestor and then start tracing that ancestor's descendants. See what happened to his children and his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. And if you can get down to that fifth or sixth or seventh generation, you can see where all those descendants have ended up. And um, it's really kind of a fascinating thing, descendancy research. I love it. Um, and so the filters allow me to focus on a specific group of people, like all of the descendants of a single ancestor. I can make that a lot more narrow. I can just focus on a single family group of two or three generations at a time. Any of those kind of people or family group based filters I can put in place as well. So those are some of the reasons why the filters are useful is because it allows us to do some of those things. Let me show you where you can find these filters. There's actually a couple of places where they might be useful for you. The first one is uh, when you're on your main family tab in Family Tree Maker, and I'll show that to you in just a minute, um, there is an index panel on the left hand side. That is where I do the majority of my filtering. So if I hop on over here to Family Tree Maker, and if you haven't, I would advise you just to make your video viewing window full screen. Uh, you're not maybe going to be able to make out all of the little details of what's going on on my screen depending on your internet bandwidth and how clear you see what's on my screen, but you should at least be able to get an idea of placement on the page of where things are here in Family Tree Maker. So I'm here, um, I'm, in the P I'm on the P button and I'm in the family tab as opposed to the person tab um, which looks like this okay so I'm in the family tab and the family tab is where I do most of my work because it's just a singular view of everything and so I really love that now some of these windows are collapsible which means I have these little arrows here and I can pop things in and out so I have my pedigree here at the top um, the person highlighted here is the same person who, whose family group shows up down here in the bottom, and it's the same person who shows up over here in the individual panel on the right-hand side. It's also, if I pop out this index, the name that is highlighted in this list over here on the left-hand side. So that's how the family view works if you haven't seen it or used it before. Now right down here in the index panel, there is a filter button, and I can click that and it shows me my full list of all 59,077 people in my tree. And I can then filter people into a list. And I can do it, I can do it one at a time. Just include this person, and I want to include this person, and maybe this person. I can do that one at a time. Or I can use these ancestor or descendant buttons. So I could select somebody and say, show me all of their ancestors or show me all of their descendants. And those are really specific words with very specific meanings that sometimes we misuse. An ancestor is a parent, grandparent, great-grandparent, great-great-grandparent, and so on. It is not aunts and uncles or great-aunts and uncles. Or, you know, it is the, the direct blood parental lineage. That's what ancestors are. Descendants are the people who come after you. So children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, so on, right? And again, it's just those, those direct people who carry your bloodline forward. So that's the, those two buttons. And then we have this filter in button, and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit more detail in just a moment. Um, and then we have uh, exclude and filter out buttons as well. And we'll talk about those as well. So I'm just going to click exclude all right now and you'll notice it clears my list so I can start over. So here in the index panel, the filter button is where you're going, is the first place where you're going to find that you can work with or manipulate your database to create specific lists of people. The second place you're going to find it, and this is the other place where I, where I use it, um, is in the publish button to create lists that you can print. So if I'm back in Family Tree Maker, up here at the top I have my publish button. I can come in here and I can say I want to create a custom report of a specific list of people, or I want to create an index of individuals for a specific subset of people in my tree. Um, you can you can use you can do that, right? So I can come here and I can say I want to create a custom report. I'm going to go ahead and click create report, and I have this option here to do it either. I can do it immediate family only, 
I can do all individuals in my whole tree, or I can do selected individuals. And then when I click this individuals to include button, it brings up that same filter box that we just saw. Now, I had already created a list, a filtered list for a report here. So I've got 3,845 people in this filtered list right now in the publish button, okay? So there are actually two independent lists. The filter here under the index, you'll notice nobody here because I haven't created a filtered list yet. Under publish, when I click on this individuals to include button for this particular report, I have a list of people because I had created it previously. So two independent lists um, or independent ways you can create where you can create those filtered lists. Like I said, I do most of mine in the index tab because I'm creating small lists of people to work with as I do research. But some of you, and I do this sometimes as well, may want to create something you can actually print out. Um, sometimes I'll create a list of things to print out and then I'll just work with the piece of paper next to me and check things off as I go. It's, it's a way to keep track. It's a way to focus yourself and keep yourself on task. So those are where, the two places where you can find um, filters in Family Tree Maker. Now, let's talk about how to do this because this is probably the most important thing. Um, the first thing you need to do is think about what kind of a list you want to create. Are you going to create a location-based list? Are you going to create an event-based list? Um, one of the things, as, as I talk here, you're probably going to come up with ideas of the kinds of lists you want to create. So rather than um, trying to listen and do something, I suggest you just get out a little notepad and start jotting down some ideas about the kinds of lists that you might want to create to work within your research. And you'll have some that'll come to you as we, as we go along here. Then write down the parameters for that group of people. Um, I'll walk through a few examples here so this will make some more sense in just a minute, but think about the kind of list. So if I'm going to create a place-based list, the parameters would be the location, right? So I'm looking for a list of anybody who died in Los Angeles County, California. Uh, because then I want to take that list of anybody who died in Los Angeles County, California and go find burial records for those people. So that would be the kind of a list I would want to create is a location based. The parameters are anyone who died in Los Angeles County and then the purpose is so that I can research burial records in that county for these people. Okay and then this is, this is the tricky part, and this is where some people get a little bit tripped up. It, um, it's almost like a math problem, and it sounds a little bit more complicated than it really is. I will walk through a few examples so that you can see how to do this, but sometimes you have to filter, you have to include a whole bunch of people, and then filter people out based on different criteria. And, and so you have to think about what do you have to filter in, and then what do you have to filter out to get the list that you are interested in? So let's look at a few examples. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. We're going to start super simple and then we're going to get a little bit more complicated. So the first example is I want to create a list of all descendants of a specific ancestor. So I'm working on a descendancy project or I'm working on a family reunion and I want to see who are the living descendants of a specific ancestor. Um, there's lots of ways I can do this. And so um, the first thing I'm going to want to do is filter in all descendants of a specific ancestor. And that is super simple. So I'm looking here at John Woodruff, who is my oldest known Woodruff ancestor. You notice the little arrow here is not dark, it's white, which means there's nobody beyond him. So this is the my oldest known ancestor on this particular branch of my family. So I'm going to click filter and John you'll see here is highlighted and I want to click descendants. So there are 306 descendants of John that I have identified and that's this filtered list. Now when I click OK you'll notice here my number changed from 59,077 to 306. It didn't delete or eliminate or get rid of any those other 59,000 people. It just is giving me a specific list of people to work with. You'll notice down here there's a little checkbox and it says apply filter. If I uncheck that, I've got my 59,000 people back in my index view. If I check that, 
I'm back to my list of 306. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, this is a way for me to just focus my research. If I'm interested in working on just this one family who for the most part moved from Indiana to Washington County, Arkansas and have stayed there. Um, and so it, it gives me a focused list of people to work my way through, okay? And then I can, there are a few things I can do. I can just now start working with this list. You know, I'm going to maybe come over here and then I'm going to look at this. And um, as a matter of fact, I think we just received word that um, one of my cousins in this family just passed away this week. And so I can come in and enter that information. And, um, you know, maybe I have a, have a couple of families that lived in the same county or the same location. And so I want to see, you know, how they, how they lived in proximity to each other. And so it's just a really focused, simple way to get a list of people um, that are descended from a single person. Now, I can then come in here and further filter this list. So let's say I'm putting together a family reunion. And really, I'm only interested, I'm, I'm not just interested in all of the descendants of John Woodruff. I'm specifically interested in those who are still living, right? So what I'm, So I've got my list of 306 here. Now I need to filter some people out. I need to filter out the people who are deceased. So I'm going to start with that. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say filter out anybody where the death date is not blank. Which means if there is something in the death date field, it's going to remove them from that list. And so I click OK and it takes it a minute and now I'm down to 224 people. But I look over here and I see I still have some people in here who were born in the 1800s. What that probably means is that I haven't done enough research to discover a death date for them. So now I want to filter out anybody who was born before, and let's just say 1913. So if they are older than 100, um, I want them off the list because chances are they're not still living. And so again, it takes it just a minute and now I'm down to 198 people and I can click OK and now here is my list of people that are likely still living that I could start to contact or do research to look for current addresses or search for them on Facebook or um, you know find information so that I can contact them. I do have a field in my um, that I've created a custom field for a Facebook URL. There's also a field um, that's just not showing in this view for an address and a phone number and an email. So I can create these lists of living relatives for family reunion purposes and Family Tree Maker now turns into a database for me. I could even go so far as to say, you know what, filter out anybody who has a Facebook ID who has something in this Facebook field because I've already located them, I want to locate the rest of the people. So lots of fun things you can do with those filters. So that's just one example. Creating a list of descendants of a specific ancestor is as simple as just selecting that ancestor, clicking that descendants button, but then you can further refine and filter that list down to a specific workable list of people depending on what your goal is or what you're working on. Okay, let's get a little bit more complicated. Here's another example. I want to create a list of anyone who might be buried in a specific location. So what I want to do is I want to filter in anyone who died in Carroll County, Arkansas. Oop. So come back over here. I'm going to click on filter. Now it's still going to have my old list here. So if I want to get rid of that, I just need to click this exclude all button and it sets my list back to zero, okay? So I want to filter in anybody where the death place, so I have the, um, my fact here is death, but the default is date, so I want to change that to place. So where the death place contains Carroll County, Arkansas. And I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And again, um, this filter process sometimes takes a few minutes depending on the criteria that you've put in because, and depending on the size of your database. So now I have a list of 408 people who died in Carroll County, Arkansas. Now, if I'm using this list specifically to look for burial locations, I could also then filter out um, anybody who, is, who I already have burial information for. Now, 
this vital facts button here just shows you name, sex, birth, marriage, and death. I could look at all facts, which then contains your whole list of all facts, including custom facts that you've created. Um, and then the other radio button up here is for other, which is just a more broad way to filter some things. So I could filter by, rather than filtering by a death date or a birth date or location, I could filter by any place. So rather than saying I want just people who died in Carroll County, Arkansas, I could say I want anybody who had any life event in Carroll County, Arkansas. Um, that's what this other radio button is. Right now, though, for this purpose, I'm going to go ahead and click all facts and I want to find my burial fact. And again, that place is what I'm interested in. And I want it to be uh, not blank, which means what I'm doing is I'm filtering out from this list of 408 people, anybody where the burial information has already been filled in. And so then I can go ahead and click OK. Again, it's going to take just a moment. And now that list of 408 drops down to 310. So I have in my database 310 people who, were, who died in Carroll County, Arkansas, for whom I have no burial information. And so now I can go do that very specific location-based research looking for the burial records. Now, the reason why this is important for me to do it this way, because some of you may be thinking, well, why would I want to do it this way? Why don't I just focus on one person at a time like I always do? Well, one of the things I've discovered is that when we do location-based research, we can be a lot more focused, we can make more efficient use of our time, and we start to see patterns in the family a lot quicker. Because when you start to see that, oh, you know, the heirs and the boys are all buried in the same cemetery. And uh, maybe I want to look for some of these other families like the Bobos or the Garrisons in that same cemetery, um, even though they were even though they died in Boone County or Crawford County. Because if other people in the family are buried there, maybe there was a family plot or maybe, right? So those are the kinds of reasons why I do location based research, because it really helps me start to make some of those connections and it also very often will help me fill in some of those missing gaps that I might not have noticed or paid attention to before. So that is a list, a location-based list and how I would use it. Okay, I have a couple more examples and we only have a few more minutes so I will try to get through these. Um, one of the things that we want to do sometimes is event-based research. So the example here would be to create a list of men eligible for the World War I draft. So maybe I would start with a filtering in of all males. Let's just start broad, right? You filter a gr large group of people in, and then you filter them out based on some specific criteria. So let's come over here to Ancestry.com, and let's actually look at the World War I um, database, because that, there's some important information there that will be really helpful for this filter. So I just come to the card catalog on Ancestry.com, I click on this military button, and the World War I draft cards is that first database then that comes up. Now, you're probably used to seeing this, okay? Um, this is the search box. Below the search box, if you haven't noticed this before, we have source information, and then we have what we call our database description that gives some really detailed information about the type of people that are included in these records and why they were created and you know, what we're going to discover in them. Interestingly enough, in this particular collection here, we have in this database description very specific information about who was eligible for the draft. So, um, the first, second, and third registrations, men born between June 6, 1886 and June 5, 1896. Second registration was anybody who had turned eight, 20, uh, anybody who had turned 21 since the first registration. And then third registration is they broadened it, right, to men between 18 and 45. So now we have a date range. Anybody born between 11th of September 1872 and the 12th of September 1900 who was living in the United States and was male was eligible for the World War I draft. So that gives us a really specific set of things to filter out. We can filter out anyone born before 1872 because they would be too old, and we can filter out anyone born after 1900 because they would be too young. And then I'm going to add one final filter because anybody who died before 1918, 
obviously would not be um, eligible for that draft in 1918. So here's what that filter is going to look like. Again, I'm going to come in here and click exclude all to start over. I'm going to filter in by gender, where the gender equals male. So this could take a minute. <laughs> so in my tree of um, in my tree of 59,000 people here, I'm going to assume that about half of them are male. We'll see if that holds true um, once it catches up with me here. And then once I get this list of all males in my tree, then I can start to filter them out. I could also just, if I wanted to, add a filter by location, right? Because really, out of these 30,000 men, I'm only interested in men who were living here in the United States at the time. But let's just do this by birth, age first, and see how that goes. So I want to filter out anybody who was born before 1872. And then if you remember, um, because they would be too old, then I'm going to do another filter to get rid of anybody who was born after 1900. This is, these are large lists of people I'm working with here. <laughs> filter anyone who was born after 1900. And that's going to cut that list down again, probably pretty significantly this time. A lot of my people are its descendants. And I do a lot of descendancy research. So, OK, and then I'm going to filter out anybody who died before 1918. And now I should have um, a list of men that I could then go search for specifically in that um, World War I draft cards database. There may be some exceptions. There are some additional filters I could use. Like I said, I could filter out anybody who wasn't living in the United States. Um, I could filter out anybody who has no information or blank information. Lots of different ways to use that. Okay, last few minutes here, and I think this is our last example. So one of the things that we sometimes struggle with, and this one's a little bit more complicated, is it's easy to create a list of men, for example, who were born in a certain date range if we know those dates, or people who died or lived in a certain location if we know that information. But what if you don't know information about people? You need to make some inferences based on the people around them. That's good genealogy. You start to look at family structure and family information. I was um, helping a woman on tweet chat yesterday who was trying to find um, some immigration information for this couple and wanted to know who their parents were. And so the first question I asked her was, what year was their first child born in Canada? And she said, I don't, I don't need to know about that. I want to know about the immigration information for this couple. And it took me a few tries, and hopefully she finally got it, to help her understand that if she could identify when that first child was born in Canada, she now had a window of time to be able to determine when they immigrated. She had an, uh, a marriage record in Scotland, and if she could find that first child in Canada, she now has a range to work for. And so sometimes um, we have to think about the family in context in order to craft the right question to get to the information that we need. And so uh, filters can help you do this. So here's an example. If I want to create a list of all couples in my database, who um, were from California. I could even just say, let's see if they were married in California. Let's start there. And then I, then I can find their children. So in Ancestry.com, if we come back up here to the search and click on the card catalog, I want to look at the California birth um, records database. So it comes up again right here when I just type California into that title field. The California birth index that we have available online starts in 1905 and it goes through 1995. So this is a database of children born in that time period. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I want to be looking for couples who were still having children in 1905, and I kind of use it as an outside number, any woman who is 50 years old or younger in 1905, and then any couple who um, would still be having children in 1995. So here's how I wrote my filters. I want to filter in anyone married in California. Let's just start there. 
Then I'm going to filter out anyone married before 1875, because I don't imagine that they'll be having children still in 1905. And I'm going to filter out anyone married after 1995. So that's how I'm going to craft this last filter here that I'll just show you. So create a fresh list. I want to filter in. Now you'll notice here, marriage is one of my vital records. Place contains California. So I'm filtering in anybody who was married in the state of California. And we'll see how big that list is. I don't imagine it's, well, no, I have a lot of cousins from California. <laughs> 832. Okay, so then we're going to filter out anybody where the marriage date was after 1995. And that should get rid of quite a few of them, I think. And then we're going to filter where the marriage date is before 1875. And that will take me down to a grand total of, oh, hey, 774 people. Um, again, those are couples, and both parts of the couple are listed here. But here's what I can then do with this information. So let me just use this family as an example. Here is this cousin of mine. He's a second cousin twice removed, and this is his wife. And what I can do then in the California marriage or birth database here is I can say I want to see all children born with the last name of Kelsey who have a mother with the last name of Adams. I mark both of those exact and now I have a list of five possible children for this couple that I can then identify. Now in this case I've already identified them but if you didn't know who their children were you could then use this to do that. Um, obviously these two are the only ones who are of the right age to be the children and in the right location to be the children of that couple. So that's how I do some of that a little bit more complicated where you're trying to find information you don't know yet based on family structure or family information. I could go on for days, but we're like three minutes overdue. <laughs> but um, there are lots and lots and lots of different examples of the kinds of filters that you might want to create. And so I'm going to encourage you, um, if you are watching an archived version of this on YouTube, to go ahead and in the comments, please leave a note about the kinds of filters that you're doing. I think if we share with each other, that will help spark some ideas about the kinds of lists that we could be creating the ways in which we can focus our research, some of the ways in which these filters can give us really specific lists that will help move our research forward. So please leave a comment um, if you're watching this on YouTube so that we can get an idea for and share some of those ideas of ways in which we're filtering. If you're watching this live, of course, as almost always, I will be available on chat in just a few minutes to answer any specific questions you may have and, it, and um, hopefully we can chat there as well about some of the fun ways that you can use filters. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.